but now we come to Michael Steinkamp. Um, we've been working a lot together for the last three years. She's been curator at the Stiftung for three years now, very getting into the depth of um, the reception of art and dealing with all the matters of everyday, the everyday work in the foundation. First of all, thank you very much for the very fruitful collaboration we've been having for the last three years. Today she's focusing on the consignment Gropius and the Harvard Museum gave to ARP and the work which was realized there. May I hand over the word to you? First of all, I'm very happy that you're that so many people came here today to hear about um, ARP and his reception in the US um, yesterday and today. And as Loretta Württemberger pointed out correctly, I will talk about Walter Gropius' commission of the Harvard Relief from Hans Arp in 1950. Hans Arp traveled to New York for the first time during the winter of 1948 to 49 for the opening of his premier solo exhibition in the United States. He put a lot of stock in the show held at Kurt Valentin's Buchholz Gallery as he viewed the American market as the only viable alternative to the European one for his art at that time. Since Walter Gropius, the German architect who taught in the US, had commissioned Arp to create a relief for the Harvard Graduate Center at the same time as well, the artist recognized this as his chance to achieve renown for himself and his work in America. On April 20, 1950, he wrote to Valentin, quote, Dear Valentin, the tiresome preparations for my journey are finally over. On Thursday night, I fly to New York. Friday afternoon, I'll come knocking at the door of your dear little Kunstkammer, outfitted with snow goggles, so that the saturated gold won't blind me. Then I fall into your arms. I'll be staying with the Hulbergs. He's referring to Richard Hülsenberg, um, who emigrated to the United States in the end of the 30s. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you again, although I can only stop in New York for a little while on my way to Harvard University in Cambridge. A great task awaits me there. It will lead to fame, and as such, hopefully, will result in my own golden inlet in your little Kunstkammer." Unquote. When Up wrote the letter, he was just about to depart for his second stay uh, in the United States just one year later. However, this time he had a letter of recommendation from Harvard University. Walter Gropius had invited him to view the already finished graduate center which the architect had designed together with the TAC, the Architects Collaborative. How Arp and Gropius first came into contact remains unknown. Yet it is likely that the two knew, knew each other from Paris, where Gropius had organized the Deutsche Werkbund exhibition in 1930. In 1930. Siegfried Gideon, whom Arp knew well, also may have played a role in their introduction. The Swiss architectural historian had taught with Gropius in the architecture department at Harvard from 1938 to 39, and again in 1950. Gropius had been appointed professor of architecture at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard in 1937. Before that, he had lived in exile in London since 1934, as the National Socialist rise to power in 1933, had seriously diminished his chances for commissions. Shortly after his arrival at Harvard, Gropius had tried to align its architecture program with the Bauhaus teachings and ideas he had been developing since 1919. His strategy was both conceptual and personal in that he brought former friends and colleagues to teach at Harvard, including Josef Albers and Marcel Breuer, as well as Martin Wagner, the former municipal building officer of Berlin. Gropius' recommendation had also helped Siegfried Gideon secure his teaching positions at Harvard. 
In addition to changing the curriculum, Gropius promoted Bauhaus principles by the mean of architecture itself. After his arrival in Cambridge, he and Breuer realized a large number of projects in the US. Nevertheless, it was a full decade after his appointment that Harvard University commissioned Gropius to design a new complex of buildings. Um, on its traditional and time-honored campus. It was not only the first modern building complex at Harvard, but also the first modern building of any kind at one of the major universities in the United States. I'm showing you here a couple of photographs um, of the complex um, Gropius designed in collaboration with the THC. And um, on the left-hand side, you see a detail um, with covered pathways which uh, connected the different dormitories um, of the Harvard Graduate Center. Um, on top you see an aerial view of the complex and on the bottom you see the grad um, the, uh, you see Harkness Commons, the student center, which will play a special role in the commissions of artworks um, at the Graduate Center. The Harvard Graduate Center was the first large public project that Gropius realized in the United States in collaboration with the TAC, a group of young architects who had studied under him at Harvard. It is comprised of an ensemble of eight steel frame buildings, seven three-story dorms and a single-story student center with a dining hall and lounges. Outside was a sunken garden. Actually, actually, you can't really see the sunken garden, but it's supposed to be here. You, you can see it better when you have a different photograph from a different angle. As Siegfried Gideon elaborated in his 1954 uh, biography of Gropius, the architects wanted to dissolve the individual building masses into a sweeping open design. A sense of lightness and movement would be created through the interplay of mass and space, interior and exterior, thereby allowing for a new spaceless experience. In its boldly modernist formal language, the Harvard Graduate Center differed markedly from the rest of the more traditional architecture on campus. Gropius aimed to develop a new architectonic language in which the dynamic needs of the present found a contemporary form of expression. For Gropius and his comrades in the TAC, this also meant educating the public about the aesthetic and emotional properties of art and architecture. They saw that over the course of the Industrial Revolution, these more subjective aspects of the arts had suffered due to an overemphasis on facts and logic. In an essay on, in the Harvard Alumni Bulletin of October 1950, Gropius argued for a code of visual value, elaborating that architects should no longer, quote, flounder about in a lingerless world of borrowed artistic expression, should this continue, Gropius continued, then we shall not succeed in giving form and substance to our own culture, for this implies selective choice of the artistic means which best express ideas and spiritual directions of the time. Although he bemoaned the lack of visual literacy in his article, Gropius was convinced that the obstacle was not insurmountable. Rather, students must be given the opportunity and time to look at art in order to increase their visual skills. For this reason, he designed an artistic program for the Graduate Center. Gropius commissioned artworks from former Bauhaus colleagues, among others, Herbert Bayer, Herbert Bayer, um, Josef Albers, and the Hungarian Georgi Kepes were all living and working in the US by then. Bayer created a mural for a smaller dining room in Harkness Commons, the student center, as well as a wall panel of colored tiles along the ramp leading to the second floor. This one. Albers 
contributed an abstract brick relief situated behind the fireplace that was between the lobby and the adjoining music and common room, which is this. By contrast, Capaz designed a series of world maps for the entrance halls. An example of them you see on the bottom. One American artist received a commission, the sculptor Richard Lippold, who made an abstract sculpture, the World Tree, made of rust-free metal tubing that stands almost 10 meters high and grazed the lawn in front of Harkness Commons which is this sculpture. Harvard had insisted that at least one young American artist has to be involved. In addition, Gropius requested designs for the Graduate Center from John Miro and Hans Saab. You see the work of Miro on the right-hand um, right side, and above you see the relief of Hans Saab. Whereas Miro created an abstract composition in oil on canvas of over six meters for the dining room at Harkness Commons, Arp designed two multi-part reliefs. In contrast to Miro, who never visited the site, Arp traveled to Harvard in April 1950 in order to get a sense of the architectural space. Nevertheless, before, the, before his arrival on campus, he seems to have made two sketches for morals, which are preserved at the Bush Reisinger Museum, now part of the Harvard Art Museums. And thanks, Robert, for providing the images for me. <laughs> um, here you can see the uh, first designs Hans Arp made. Arp embedded watercolor designs for the two planned reliefs within architectural renderings. The two ceiling high reliefs were to be comprised of the, um, of the discrete biomorphic forms that are so characteristic of the artist. Differing in shape and size, these forms would create a sense of rhythmic movement across the surface of the wall. Upon closer inspection, it is clear that the designs not only starkly differ from the final work, but that they are also intended for an entirely different space. In 1958, John Coolidge, the director of the Forgat Museum at the time, clarified the reason for this discrepancy. Quote, I was commissioned to do a mural at the end of a student common room in one of the dormitories occupied by the law school students. A leading New York law firm agreed to pay for the common room. When they saw the sketch of the ARP, they refused to have the ARP included in the room they were paying for. Thus, when ARP arrived, they had to improvise a commission for him at the last moment." Unquote. The initial designs were therefore never realized. Siegfried Gideon likewise confirmed that both of ARP's plans, as well as Miro's design, found little resonance within the building project's donors and were therefore rejected. Ultimately, ARP designed two multi-part wood reliefs that were to be installed on opposite walls in the dining room of Harkness Commons. I'm showing you here the two realized reliefs. Norman Fletcher, an architect a member, and member of the TAC, recalled that ARP made numerous sketches and drawings on site in order to finalize the composition. Both reliefs were reinstalled in the beginning of 1958, and it was determined that they hung too low. Arp had, no consi had not considered that tables would be placed in front of the wall and that people would interrupt the picture plane, as he put it in a letter to Gropius in 1952. The constellation of the relief on the right, the lower one, on this one on the bottom, was subsequently changed as simply hanging the forms higher was not possible. The two reliefs that were realized in 1950 consist of, consist of individual biomorphic forms made from American redwood that are scattered across the long side of the dining room. As in their original designs, the separate organic forms of various sizes enter into playful dialogue with one another. 
For ARP, the individual forms were not as important as the interplay between them and their relationships to the surface and to the surrounding space. He conceived, he conceived of his composition as not fixed, but rather as temporary formation with the possibility of being continually changed and developed. The artist drew inspiration for his reliefs and also for his continuous variability in nature, particularly in the elemental yet transcendental forms of stars, clouds and stones, as their ongoing met metamorphosis cannot be manipulated or controlled by humankind. I refer to these entities as cosmic forms. In Forms, the text of 1950, he elaborated, quote, the forms that I created between 1927 and 1948 and that I called cosmic forms were vast forms, meant to englobe a multitude of forms such as the egg, the planetary orbit, the path of the planets, the bot, the human head, the breast, the, she the seashell, the waves, the bell. I constellated these forms according to the laws of chance." Unquote. These forms arranged according to the laws of chance are indeed composed. Nevertheless, it was the moment of chance, the moment of intuitive creation, that I wanted to emphasize. These apparently random but in actuality carefully planned biomorphic constellations had been a central aspect of his art since the 1930s. They are found in his collages and writings as well as in his reliefs. In these works are utilized a limited repertoire of similar forms which he continually arranged anew. To this end, he began using cardboard cutouts, so-called decoupage, that he rearranged until he was satisfied with his composition. He would then transpose the composition to a cardboard mock-up, to a cardboard mock-up. In this way, Arp also created the template for the Harvard Relief. Um, in a letter to Walter Gropius from April 27, 1950, Arp described this, his process, quote, Meanwhile, I've used cardboard to create three different interplays of form that will hopefully serve my work. These forms are not infinite, silent forms that I used to create, but primitive forms which veil meaning. For me, they are more human and beautiful in a primitive sense, unquote. The forms up created and arranged culminated in two cardboard mock-ups, photographs of which are preserved in the archive of the App Foundation and which I'm showing you here. Uh, we don't know where the original cardboard mock-ups are, but they are probably somewhere um, in the US or they are destroyed. Um, because App did not make these mock-ups by himself. Rather, he left cutouts and designs at Harvard University that they were transferred to cardboard on site. This process was typical for Arp. Since executing his earliest reliefs in the late teens, he had had relied upon the assistance of craftsmen. What counted most were the idea and the creation of a specific form. Moreover, later changes to his reliefs were not out of question. Up's earlier constellations were small in size. The artist realized the principles behind them on a monumental scale and in relationship to the surrounding architecture for the first time in the Harvard Relief. In 1957, the art historian Carola Gideon Welker described the reliefs and their integration within the architectural space of the Graduate Center as follows. Quote, like passing stars, clouds, birds, and leaf, leaves, the forms move along the regularly veined and wooden wall, broadening finally into constellations. It is a relaxed, poetic interplay of motions, form, and surfaces. 
Arp's fantastic world is here incorporated into a daily life of a young generation which lives in this environment. Walter Gropius, by coupling with this building, these irrational spheres and that transcendent its spatial and functional tasks, gave proof of an especially sensitive understanding of our present needs. Unquote. It was just this union of rationality and irrationality, the technical and the creative, the functional and the subjective that led Gropius to commission a design from Arp for the Graduate Center in the first place. Through the artistic scheme within his building complex, Gropius aimed to expose the young generation that frequented its halls to a new level, to a new level of perception that would supersede the purely rational and the everyday. And I, I think Arp's constellation really fit or align perfectly to this um, with Gropius' goal for his overall project of the Harvard Graduate Center. Gropius' commission for the Graduate Center sparked a wide, um, sparked a wide demand for large-scale release from ARP, including one for the University of Caracas in Venezuela in 1956, and another one for the headquarters of the UNESCO in Paris in 1958. The Harvard relief was crucial for these later commissions. And it is said that um, the Harvard relief was indeed the basis for the design of the relief he made uh, for the UNESCO in Paris. The realization of the Harvard relief also marked the beginning of Hans Arp's international artistic reputation. As the artist himself had recognized in advance, the commission ultimately served, at, uh, served as an artistic calling card that made his work famous in the US. In this respect, the significance of the European immigrant scene in New York, with which Arp maintained close contact, cannot be overestimated. People like Kurt Valentin, Hans Richter, Richard Hülsenberg, Josef Albers, and last but not least, Walter Gropius, who had already known and appreciated his work back in Europe, provided him with the opportunities to hold exhibitions and carry out projects in the US. As I mentioned in the beginning of my paper, Arp thought that, the wake, that in the wake of the Second World War, the American market provided a singular chance for financial success. In a letter to Maya Sacher of February 20, 1950, he wrote, quote, America is the only country where I'm currently selling, and is also the place where I have the most admirers for my art. There are practically no French collectors of my work. The whole time that I've lived there, I've only sold to three, to three French collectors. For the time being, Germany holds no serious prospects, and my Swiss collectors love me, but, don't, uh, but haven't bought much recently." Unquote. Actually, this would not be the case for long. Arp's work found increasing recognition in Europe and in exhibitions and awards. And it all began with Arp's sojourn in the United States, and in my opinion, with the realization of, the, of Gropius' commission for the Harvard Relief. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? I'm interested in the um, subtext I've been hearing about a certain evolution of the American reception of art, which Thank you. <laughs> has to do with a, let me call it an institutionalization or a kind of what I see as a certain impression of a kind of potency of his work. And I'm wondering in this context, which I've just loaded for you, could you say a little bit more about the reasons why those original, those first um, designs for the space were rejected and why it was placed. I'd just be curious to know a little bit more about the conditions of that shift. Actually, I, I, we do, I didn't find any um, hint why they actually, uh, why he didn't realize it. But as I, as I quoted it, and uh, as I quoted it, it was just the money, uh, 
the donors didn't want the work of up in their um, in this location, and so they had nobody to pay for. And so um, we have a quote. Uh, we have um, some. Um, Zip Gideon is, is um, actually writing about this commission and there he says uh, nobody wanted to pay uh, for the work of Arp and Miro but we found another donor but this was also when Arp was already in the US and they decided to do a different um, project. So they had to decide because they didn't have the money for the realization of this project and I think this this is a simple fact. <laughs> yeah, I wondered about the background wall. It's uh, flat in the cardboard and who decided or how did they get to this um, paneling or planking? Actually, Arp didn't like it at all, and we <laughs> and we have uh, we have correspondence. Um, and as I said, the the work was changed in 1958, and we have correspondence going on from 1952, where Arp is claiming that he wants to have the uh, the to have the relief installed differently and that he actually wanted to have a background which is flat and which doesn't have this uh, really ugly, uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. But um, due to financial problems, um, they didn't realize this either. Up also claimed that he wanted to have the, um, the reliefs painted and it didn't happen. So. Um, it was just all in the change when Gropius left, uh, left Harvard and the project just uh, didn't get much interest. And um, maybe just to add this to my, to my talk, actually the relief is not installed at Harvard um, anymore. Like also all the other works from Albers and Bayer, you can't see them at the moment. And I think Robert Wiesinger and Lena Ross at the Bush Rising are just trying to get them reinstalled and to make them public again, which I think would be a very good idea. <laughs> but I think it, it was a lack of money that the change didn't happen. Uh, I think you've already answered half of my question. Does the <laughs> building still exist? The building, yes, but um, I think nearly all of the commissions are uh, not installed anymore, but you probably know more, Robert. The building does exist. <laughs> uh, it's been, uh, uh, the art has been built by uh, attorney, law, 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 law people, uh, so consequently it hasn't been cared for. Um, uh, certain aspects have been, <laughs> have been covered over, the buyer's been covered over with an inoffensive contract furniture kind of abstraction, uh, 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 inexplicably. But I did want to ask, and this introduces a kind of interesting question. So at times, the, the, the figures were painted, then the ground was painted, and they were moved, and they were removed. This question of becoming, as a maybe more precise term than the biomorphic, as we think about how to reinstall these, hmm. and we fetishize the kind of originary state and the authorial intention, I guess I wonder, should we, and, and, and what is... The original intention. What is, what is, what is an original <laughs> intention? And uh, uh, Anyway, yes, it is, it is our intention to uh, uh, return these to their place, um, at least by the 2019 centennial of the Bauhaus founding. Um, but I just wanted to introduce that question of becoming and uh, change, which, of course, ARP might have appreciated it, at least when it didn't damage uh, or <laughs> destroy his work. No, he, he um, and he actually is mentioning that in his correspondence as well. Um, when they were talking about, we have to um, that they had to hang the the reliefs higher because of the tables, and they couldn't really see the um, installation. He's actually saying that um, it fits with his um, thoughts about the variable variability or the change of uh, the work itself. So it was no problem for him to, to reinstall it. Mm. But he has like specific ideas who weren't realized. Mm. 
just want to say uh, for the UNESCO reliefs, they've also been moved uh, inside and they're now in the ground uh, in the floor near the conference room on a, on a wall in this kind of uh, uh, composition, uh, but a bit different. They're also higher up. They're, they've been hired up. <laughs> I don't know how you say um, for Caracas, um, I don't know precisely, but I think it's still like this. I met somebody who said, actually, the person who's running this, uh, the Department of the Artwork at the Caracas University is fighting very hard to conserve all the artworks because they are very important artworks there. And they're in pretty good shape, somebody told me. I mean, I hope I've not been there since then, but... I hope it's the case, huh. because you can see also next to the relief of art is Sophie Teuber, the Obed uh, evocation. Thank you. Uh, well. <laughs> I've been in Cambridge in the year 2000 when we gave a talk at the GSD Credit School of Design, and for sure we took our chance to see the law building and it was the year when all the students were sitting in front of the screens to see the O.J. Simpson trials. And uh, I went up to see uh, the work of ARP and uh, I saw students rocking their chairs against the relief and it was so appalling that I approached them and told them this is an important work of art, don't you know what you're doing? And uh, they had no idea where they were and what it was. and. Uh, so um, from the beginning, obviously, nobody took care that there was a certain distance. It's not about the hate. The hate, for sure, is a problem. But uh, the chairs were standing right in front of the, of the work of art, and uh, they were always bumping against it. So that was a problem from the beginning, obviously. And it was not only a problem for, for Absberg, but also for the Miro which they changed as well. So the old painting is the oil mirrors now in the Museum of Modern Art. And they installed, um, I think, kind of a mosaic uh, work instead. So they, they, they <laughs> recognized it quite early that um, students and the artworks doesn't really fit together in this context. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, the idea of the composition of this relief in Harvard with the idea of the composition of uh, prehistorical painting in caves? Mm, related to the Harvard relief, I, I didn't read, uh, read anything about it. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I don't know at the moment. Thanks. Okay, if there are aren't any more questions, I think we just get some lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>